Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, so I am so pleased uh, to be here and to have Jolie and John join me today uh, for our session. Uh, Jolie and I first met a little over five years ago at a conference where Jolie was evaluating technology solutions for a Samaritan house. Uh, Jolie is a long, lifelong nonprofit professional and has been with Samaritan House for almost 15 years. Uh, she is really wonderful uh, resource and her and I connect often. Uh, John's firm, Davidoff Strategies, helps organizations in many different ways with a focus on strategic planning. I first met John at our uh, JMT conference, Innovate, where he was presenting a session and knew, okay, I have to work and have a further conversation. And John has actually been working with JMT on our uh, mission-driven uh, strategy and culture. So we have two phenomenal people here with us today for this session. So we're here going to talk about uh, understanding about mission-driven strategy. Uh, we all go through strategic planning and we know how extremely important it is, uh, as well as what a living document it should be. Uh, but it's all about also the mission of organizations. And key to that is how the CFO can really contribute to a mission-driven strategy. And this is very, very personal uh, to myself, as I am an accountant by background. I started my company with a mission and it's what's been driving us for 30 years. So this session and topic is very, very important to me. So we're going to have it in three basic uh, high level agenda items. We're going to start with the CFO's changing role. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what is mission driven strategy. And then also the ongoing alignment of the CFO and the importance of the CFO's role in the mission of an organization and the success of delivering on the mission of the organization. So, you know, I saw this slide a uh, number of years ago. And at the time, I thought to myself, so true. Uh, I was a lead finance person in a number of nonprofit organizations prior to founding JMT. And I recognized that the information that I really uh, knew and was seeing was very much a rear view uh, look, and I wasn't really contributing to the organization. The good news is that role has changed and is continuing to evolve. Um, every day, but especially in the last few years. So when we look at the role of the CFO uh, over time, it falls into four main roles. And, you know, these are, and I'm going to go into the, a little bit of these more so we can understand them. And we also have uh, polling questions that are going to be part of this so that we can be uh, interactive on this a bit. These roles are, you know, very, very important ones to an organization, every single one of them, but they are definitely different. So, the first role is that of an historian. Uh, more of a responder type of role. And, you know, historically, this has driven the CFO role where the CFO is uh, responding to requests for information or analysis, analyzing what has happened uh, in the past, uh, looking at it very closely, making sure it's uh, correct. And this was viewed a uh, very important responsibility and a role uh, but also a main driver for the role. And that has definitely changed. The finance leadership 2.0 is really where the CFO and the finance team become stewards of the organization, working with more with leadership 
and they're more forward looking versus only rear view. Uh, they're challenging departments and programs on uh, spending, the budgets, uh, you know, hiring. And typically this role needs very strong support from the CEO. It is a very important uh, role here again. And so it is one that starts to be more future looking. So I'd love to uh, invite Jolie now. In your experience, can you just share with us why the challenger role has uh, become more important in strategic planning? It has more of an impact? Oh, yes. I mean, I think um, that you know, someone has to play the part, right? And I think it, it adds balance, it adds um, impact to, to the group. And the CFO, you know, has the information um, to, to be able to play that role. And it's an important aspect, um, you know, and getting the conversations going. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Great, thanks. Yeah. So our finance leadership 3.0, uh, this is where we become, you know, what we call the architect transformer. And when we think about the architect role, it is where the CFO is working collaboratively with the directors and the managers uh, in the best financial interests for the delivery of the mission. They're working, finance is working to support programs and to find a way forward for a program or department, there might be budgetary constraints and finances working in partnership to figure out the path forward. The transformer role, the CFO is a leading partner with the CEO partnership side by side, working on the future strategies for the organization. This role is really strategic in looking at new paths for the organization to be successful in its mission. Uh, it's generating ideas and helping to envision. So, uh, John, I'd love to start with you this time. And uh, if you could share with us a little bit working with organizations on strategic planning, how have you found strategic CFOs uh, contributing? Well, thanks, Jackie, and, and hello, everyone. There is nothing more refreshing than a CFO who understands that their job does not stop at, at delivering accurate reports of what the financials are, but really it brings a mindset of going beyond that and helping an organization see how it can uh, use its finances to tap the untapped potential of an organization. Um, and there are through many, many different paths, but a, a, a really good, inspiring financial director, uh, in my experience, will challenge the norm, will say, isn't there a better way? Not necessarily a more efficient way, but a better way, a more effective way that we can have broader reach, bigger influence, and we can stretch the organization past the boundaries that as we know it currently. Uh, we call that uh, a growth mindset. Excellent. Thanks. And Jolie, you know, uh, thinking about that, what thoughts, you know, based on what John was just sharing, what thoughts would you have on this role? Well, I think in the architect transformer role, uh, one of the things is, is looking at sort of your, your finances and how, how can, um, how can they enhance this? How can they enhance this process? One of the things that I'm very um, focused on is looking at restricted and unrestricted funds for, as an example. Um, and how do you leverage those and, and sort of being agile in managing that, you can really add value to sort of this whole architect transformer process, um, you know, by, by moving things around as the organization receives funding, receives other, you know, how to use your resources in a different way. And the finance folks have a real um, insight into those areas to help staff and board. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, you can, the opportunities that exist there for the CFO in an organization is really could be significant. You just get, you gain so much, so much more insights into uh, 
um, the uh, sort of financial story when, when looking at uh, that aspect. So I'm not going to read through this slide. You will have the deck. Uh, but I think there's a lot of really great information here because we break down on this slide just basically some of the attributes of a CFO in these different roles. So when you have an opportunity to come back out and review the deck, uh, I would definitely take a look at this particular slide. Now the next slide, we're actually going to have our polling question. And so the uh, key to this is at the very top, there's the instructions. So in who you're going to be dialing, sending to the two, if you have your smartphone, it would be great. Put in 22333 as who it's to go to and text the message, Jacqueline, my name. And it's the first two initials of my last name, T-I, uh, not a one, T-I, and then five, five, seven, that will get, you'll get a confirmation that you have joined. And once you join, then if you will send off a text with your idea, thoughts on which role is best aligned with a strategic CFO, uh, we'll see if we can get some uh, real time uh, results here on what everyone's thinking is. Oh, -ho! <laughs> well, I love that. Looks like they're coming in a few at a time. Yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, well, it looks like based on who's sent them in right now, we're at the 50-50 mark. Oh, we're slightly a little bit. You have a long name, Jackie. Yes. <laughs> I should have just put Jackie, but who knew when I was originally doing this? I think what, what this speaks to, Jackie, is the versatility of the finance director professional uh, in today's marketplace. And that the days of just keeping the books are gone. Um, and as your organization matures and your situation becomes more challenging, each of us in whatever our role is uh, needs to mature and expand ourselves. And even in the ways we think, uh, and, and I think what I really like about these choices is, is they call on us to tap different parts of our brain functionality uh, at, in different situations uh, in order to uh, serve the organization. Um, I just wanted to add, add to that, you know, as, as a CFO, I was looking at your previous slide of all the attributes. And the biggest thing that struck me was, you know, People, we, we are, um, we focus on different att attributes at different parts of the organization, whatever is happening, whatever is going on in our organization. And we sort of uh, go from uh, different attributes. And, and um, as a CFO, we have strengths and, uh, you know, maybe not so much strengths in different, in those different attributes, but to sort of embrace all of them um, and how we add, you know, have this agility to go uh, and use each of those depending on the situation, I think it was really um, enlightening for me to, to see all of that in that one grid. So um, I appreciated that. Great. And I think, you know, what both of you have spoken to is, you know, exactly what we're talking about on this slide. Uh, and, you know, is that we have to be uh, agile, right? And able to cross the different roles. And, you know, I don't, I certainly this you know past year in 2020 uh, and everything we have so many of us have dealt with with the pandemic has reinforced this even more this ability to be agile to be responsive uh, and to cross these roles um, is a very important aspect of the CFO. So, you know we know uh, that there is the old way of handling finance, and then there is the new norm. And everybody, 
you know, I'm sure almost everyone, if not everyone on uh, this session has heard that term uh, new norm. And it certainly is a uh, different in environment that we're working within. Uh, and the information that's needed, the visibility to the information in order for uh, a CFO and a finance department to be able to um, meet the needs of the organization, uh, be agile, is a very, very key and important one. Uh, you know, here again, this speaks to this slide, again, speaks to the fact that the uh, so much is happening within an organization, uh, both internally and then externally to the organization. Demands for organizations' services are ever increasing. Uh, and certainly um, here again, the pandemic made that uh, very, very evident. And so there's been a lot of disruption and so the ability to be able to respond in the CFO role is really, really key. The need for increased uh, communication um, for you know, teams that are now working remotely that never did previously, and in many cases will continue to, to do so uh, for the foreseeable future. You know, a, many organizations we're speaking to are uh, reevaluating um, their placement of where their team members are and, and continuing to work remotely. There's also been the collaboration and being able to do that very easily is extremely important. So there's a lot of moving parts here and it's very difficult, you know, when you think about strategy under uncertainty, uh, where is your data coming from? Where is the information that you need to lead strategically? Uh, Jolie, I would love to hear um, about your experience at Samaritan House and, and what you're seeing uh, related to these items. Yeah, you know, one of the things, one of the things that has um, really resonated with me was the strategy under uncertainty. Um, you know, with the budget process last year and COVID, uh, we really had to move forward and we used scenario planning to, um, you know, create this budget because we didn't have perfect data and we knew that there was going to be a lot of variances. Um, There's a lot of unknowns and how to move your staff and your board through that process with, with confidence was really challenging. Um, but we did it with sort of uh, using scenarios and communication and, you know, setting the tone around um, you know, there's, there's lots of unknowns, but we have this range and we're going to be in this area of the scenario. If, if, if it moves this way, the budget moves this way. And so that was real different for us. And um, it actually worked out uh, really well. Um, and I think there was a lot of confidence in terms of the expectations around the uncertainties because you don't have perfect data and things kept changing. Um, the same process was used when we sort of went over the performance reports, you know, and all the variances, and we didn't even get into trying to explain a lot of them. It was more of concepts, and uh, it was uh, it ended up being a, a really good process. We also had data to be able to, um, you know, show how we moved into those different scenarios, so to speak, with the budget. So it is an area that I think, um, you know, the opportunity to go down paths that you haven't been able to or ha didn't need to uh, go down previously. And so- Absolutely, absolutely. And there was one um, area as well as, uh, you know, we were able to, because of this, some of these uncertainties, et cetera, we did take advantage of those um, to, to make changes. I mean, staff was much more agile to, to implement change and, and processes, make changes quicker, things that would have taken us probably months before you know, we were able to implement in a week, weeks because of the added, um, you know, not crisis, but the added change. And uh, it really was helpful to take advantage of those opportunities to move staff. Excellent. 
So now we're going to talk about, we've talked about the CFO's changing role and contribution. So now we're going to talk about mission driven strategy. Uh, so strategic planning. One of the best pieces of advice I received was when I started JMT uh, 30 years ago and um, the person, a uh, wonderful gentleman that was a real mentor to, to myself, asked me, you know, what I intended for JMT, what was my strategy? And I, you know, I said to him, well, I, uh, legacy business. And he said, well, then, you know, you need your strategic plan and you need to make sure you always are planning and that that is the foundation uh, for uh, JMT. And then the key pillars, as we call them within that foundation uh, being uh, our mission and purpose. So, you know, as an accountant, uh, this was definitely pushing me outside my comfort zone, uh, but it was probably the best uh, advice I received. And uh, every day JMT works uh, based on our pillars uh, from our strategic plan. Uh, every day it's about being mission driven. So, you know, I, I think about uh, mission driven and what it exactly means. And we started working with John Davidoff, Davidoff Strategies. So, John, I would love for you to share with us about mission driven, uh, what it means and its impact. Thank, thanks so much, Jackie. Uh, we started uh, really working in strategy uh, about 15 years ago um, after we saw a lot of organization strategies that we thought were kind of thin on critical thinking and rationale for why we're doing what we're going to be doing. And a lot of plans uh, really turn out to be glorified to-do lists, kind of things that you were do already doing and you justify why you're going to keep doing them, maybe throw some more money at this, less money at that, and boom, we got our, our plan. That's not a mission-driven plan. That's a glorified to-do list. Mission-driven strategy is where an organization looks at a situation that it's intending to address, particularly in the social sector, the nonprofit uh, community. You look at that situation and you really want to understand what is going on in the situation. What, how, what are the trends? What are the key issues? Uh, what are the other organizations that are our peers and competitors? What are they doing? And really understand the, the total picture. Uh, once you have that, and that comes through really a lot of research and interviews, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but then you know what is the situation that you're responding to. See, the, the natural human dynamic is to do things. Let's, let's get to work and let's hit that to-do list, right? Uh, but a lot of times we get really good at the doing, but we forget the context uh, of what it is we're doing for. And so that's really why we encourage organizations to be mission driven, which means that we do and we want to do well, but we do it in the context of driving towards an outcome, driving towards a shift, a paradigm shift, uh, <laughs> driving towards making the world a better place uh, is my guess with most of your missions. That's great, John. So you know, when we think about the mission driven, as you just, you know, shared with us, um, you know, I immediately think, okay, who would be part of this, you know, and what are some examples of, you know, not having a mission driven strategy? Sure. So first of all, uh, uh, really all of your stakeholders should be part of your strategic planning and we actually believe strategic planning is something that you do every day and uh, certainly throughout the year. Uh, but you want all of your stakeholders and your stakeholders are gonna be your employees, your board of directors, your funders. Uh, we encourage you to have your peer organizations as part of your stakeholders, the media, people in government uh, and so on, uh, your donors. Uh, it's really important that the, the vision 
and uh, mission of where you're going is informed by an ecosystem of stakeholders uh, and that there are not be any personal agendas or hidden agendas uh, and a really well facilitated strategic planning process will neutralize those agendas and allow the collective brain trust to take high quality data in and put out high quality planning uh, directionality for your organization. Great. So Julie, I would love to hear your, you know, from your experience, how finance uh, works with this and, uh, you know, what John just shared. Yes, yes. So, you know, I think the finance, um, the finance has a unique perspective on strategic planning and, you know, and the mission, you know, uh, we're very an analytical and focused on, um, you know, certain data and can really uh, contribute to the conversation in a, in a different way um, that complements the other folks at the table, you know, and I think embracing as a CFO, you know, I always try to, and, and, and even with, with colleagues, sort of embrace that analytical perspective because it has real value. And, and when, she, when you bring that kind of um, work to the table of strategic plan, you know, things become very real and credible and uh, it helps move the conversation. Um, so, um, you know, sometimes finance folks, I think, maybe hold back a little bit or they're not part of that sort of mission strategy com conversation. But, um, you know, I would sort of, you know, flip it on the other side and, and argue that it has a very real uh, contribution there. Um, and it, folks want to hear that, want um, want to hear that analytical perspective in the, in the financial end of it. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it, adds a, it adds quite a bit. I agree 100%. So we have another uh, polling question here. Uh, you, if you've already joined, uh, you should just be able to enter your letter that it, you're aligned with. And this was a really uh, interesting uh, question because I think you know the order of importance when it comes to an organization's mission and strategic planning can really be across the board as we see here you know the financial needs and then the strategic the order of these uh can really be unique to each organization and while we're waiting for the results to come in jackie it, it's so important uh, that we're not saying one is necessarily more important than the other. We, we really need everything to be watched over carefully. I uh, have uh, been present and helped too many organizations that didn't pay attention to their finances, that had big strategic priorities, but, no, but everyone assumed the other person was kind of making sure financially it made sense. And um, there's, we all probably know stories of uh, organizations that have gone under uh, as a result of financial mismanagement. Um, and certainly um, without the partnership between uh, mission, strategic priorities and, and financial needs, uh, we, we either are serving as, the finances are either a barrier to achieving our missions effectively or they're a facilitator. And I think that's a key question at all times. Is what we're doing a facilitator or a barrier towards being mm. uh, effective with our missions? And that's such a, a great point, John. It's, um, you know, and I look at here again on all of these, I look at them as JMT, you know, I'm doing this with my uh, company. And it is exactly the case of what you're talking about. These are all so equally important when I look at everything around JMT and our uh, strategic planning. So these are just some examples of what are often considered key strategy questions. And they're, they are key, they're very important. Um, <coughs> 
but I think that, you know, one of the things that caught my eye in this list and many other lists that I've seen when I've done any kind of research is that there's nothing specifically calling out uh, finance or the, the importance of the CFO or the financial management uh, role in this. And so, uh, John and Jolie, I would love to hear how you would tie the CFO role to these questions. And Jolie, I'll start with you first. Mm. You know, um, I, I think the CFO role is is in is has a role in all of these questions. You know, as providing support, as providing some uh, again, as I said in before, some 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 data that supports um, sort of the conversation, um, and you know, having that is 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 key i mean it's not called out you know it's just kind of there a lot um but it's not really called out specifically as you can even see in these uh key strategy questions but um it's needed in all of them and so i think bringing that to the table and you know having your voice and, and infiltrating that with all of these questions um is is really a key con uh, contributing point that the cfo can do I agree a hundred percent, you know, when I look at any of these questions. John, would you like to weigh in? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, as a, as a consultant, I work with uh, dozens of organizations every year. And uh, the very first question um, I have is, uh, may I see your financials? Yeah. Uh, or tell me, tell me about the financial situation. And I want to understand, it's really through the financials that people really represent uh, their ability to understand the mission, the vision, the priorities, and how it's being funded. Um, and, if, and that's sort of my assessment of kind of what the initial overview of organization is. And I think a really good organization makes sure that all of its stakeholders actually understands uh, how the financials tell the picture of a effectively implemented mission. Um, and that um, uh, people throughout an organization are understand that finances are important. They're our friend. They do help facilitate us towards our, our, our mission and, and we need to really be familiar with them. So part of the job of the finance director is really educator and helping people tie together what you're doing, running programs or in operations or administration or fundraising, how it ties back to the financial picture that really weaves us all together. And one, one more thing I'd like to add to that is using the financial um, piece to, uh, to actually just um, you know, uh, contribute to the story and trying to translate those numbers into the story of what you're illustrating or, you know, parts of the picture, you know, what, what is your funding strategy or um, what is, uh, you know, how are you funded, but what does that mean in sort of lay terms and translate that, those, those figures into a story? Um, that is something that can be very effective um, and then that the CFO can do um, and, and help with the conversations. I, I agree uh, with both of you and, you know, especially on the story uh, aspect of it, uh, you know, the finance team is uh, so hugely important in the CFO in this endeavor of being able to tell the story. And even if you think about, you know, the FASBs and the changes that have come down since 2016 in the new requirements with donor restrictions and things like that, one of the items that was under consideration uh, by the nonprofit council of the FASBs was about the fact of telling the story. Is there a qualitative uh, way, a quantitative way to tell the story on the mission and success of the mission? So here you have, you know, uh, accountants through and through talking about the importance of the story in the delivery of the mission and, and you know, the strategy uh, of an organization. So, so vitally important. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes folks don't want to, um, you know, they're looking at numbers or around the table and, and uh, they're not asking about the story or the story is not obvious. And so it's really helpful 
for um, finance folks to kind of step that up and have a voice and, and, and try and present that story, uh, even if it's not asked about, because it, yeah. it could be very, um, you know, a lot of people are not used to understanding the financials in terms of a story. Exactly. They don't think of the yeah. right story and numbers being at the, the same, you know. So mission, uh, this is, you know, here again, something so important and key in talking about, you know, mission drivers. We, we talk about having a mission driven strategy and that's very, very important. So, you know, then what are those mission drivers? Um, and what we have here is love to have people's thoughts, but John, I would love to have you jump in here as well. Well, it's such a, such an important question, and it and it really is part of a really good strategic planning process. Where, you, as I said earlier, you really do understand uh, what is the situation that we're addressing, and and then you say, why us? Why our organization? And I think uh, there is no one answer here. Uh, yes, you should do what you do best if it fits and is responsive to the situation. Um, uh, if what you do best is no longer relevant or less relevant, it's worth considering what you do. And if you should do something that should be adjusted, uh, if you have the resources for it. And we, we see this in a market a lot of times where one organization really has the critical thinking, the expertise to address a, a social issue, the other organization down the road has the big trust fund. They've got all the money, um, but they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, and this is why it's also important for organizations to talk to one another. And um, and you know, as finance directors, uh, we encourage you pick up the phone and talk to your peer organizations, share information. Um, yes, maybe you're competing for for funders and donor dollars, but at the end of the day, we're all competing together for a world that works for everyone uh, or specifically to your, your mission. And, uh, and sometimes kind of just understanding each other, you can figure out how you can each sort of collectively together um, address the situation. And that's such a great point, John, because, you know, we all know within the nonprofit uh, you know, segment, uh, we, I consider it the smallest world on the planet. And because we are there and helping each other and available to support each other. Uh, so, you know, what the point that you make is really an excellent one about reaching out to your peers. So John, I would love for you to share with us a little more about, uh, you know, these elements that uh, organizations can go through and that you lead through and when we talk about strategic planning process. Thanks, Jackie. We, we thought it would be helpful to have you just understand a very quick top line uh, uh, understanding of a really healthy strategic planning process. And, uh, and so it normally starts with something called a discovery phase. And it's in the discovery phase just to the name itself. We want to learn and discover uh, what is it we don't know and don't understand towards having a comprehensive understanding of the situation. And I can't say that uh, enough because that step is so often skipped and people go right into a conference room and bring in the board and they tell you what they think is the right thing to do and then tell staff to go do it. That is uh, not going to create a mission-driven organization uh, and frequently takes you in the other direction. Uh, but a really good discovery phase will have uh, vo the voice of stakeholders. So it might be interviews with stakeholders, focus groups, uh, secondary research, scanning what the media is saying, um, interviewing your peer organizations, studying other organizations' websites and their strategic plans, just getting really smart about the situation. Um, after you do that, uh, what we do is we bring all of that uh, in a report. Uh, we call it our discovery findings. And uh, we have a, a big gathering of all the stakeholders. We call it our mission-driven strategic planning summit. 
And the summit is a rallying point uh, in a planning process for us because it gets everyone engaged in the vision and the mission and the principles and the strategic priorities of the organization, unlike they do on most days. So uh, it's a very uh, uh, invigorating process. And, and the way we do it, there's a lot of participation and, um, and a lot of collaboration. And again, our job, when you have a, our, our perspective on a really good facilitator, is they're watching out for dominating voices. They're watching out for agendas that have been brought into the room, trying to neutralize those, because oftentimes it's really every voice being heard. Um, and sometimes you have to create safety in a process so that the voices that don't do well, public speaking uh, or written or whatever, that everyone's voice gets heard. Um, so that's that's a big thing we're sticklers about. From uh, the summit, you then leave with a handful of priorities, not to-dos, but priorities. And mm -hmm. one of the things we really recommend in a priority is that it resemble a paradigm shift from what to what is the organization becoming in its strategic planning uh, towards being more effective at its mission. Um, and then from there, uh, we put teams of people in working groups on each priority and voila, uh, we have our strategic plan. Very, very nice, very comprehensive. So, um, my company, JMT, we're about to begin working on our next three-year strategic plan. So, John, would you share a little bit about this methodology? Yeah, uh, this is uh, a little bit more about our specific approach, and it may resemble uh, approaches you've used, uh, hopefully. Um, but it really summarizes you know, what I was just talking about. So if you go down to the lower right-hand corner of the pyramid, the base of the whole process is built on this discovery phase. That's the research. And then if you swing over to the left-hand side, um, number two is the situation assessment. What is the problem? What is the situation that we're solving for, that we're addressing? Then you go over to the right-hand side to number three, the paradigm shifts from what to what, are we becoming to be more effective uh, towards our mission? Uh, number four, what's the ideal state? What's the, what's the win that we're orienting towards so that we're harnessing all of our resources, our finances, our programs, our grants, everything is aimed at that ideal state uh, in a collective, coherent, integrated manner. Um, swing back over to uh, number five, accountability for implementation everything has to be built on outcomes. And a lot of you already are using uh, uh, easy to read dashboards with no more than four or five metrics that really focus the organization quarter by quarter and for the year. Um, and then you can have similar dashboards for each, each department and really down to each member of your team. Great. So, Jolie, having gone through some uh, strategic plans during your 16 plus years, <laughs> how does oh, yeah. it align with your experience? Well, you know, this is, um, I really love this visual um, that um, John just went through. Um, and it's sort of what, what comes to mind for me is what we have experienced just even in this past year is taking our, um, for example, uh, we had a little subset out of our uh, strategic plan was a, our finance team alone. You know, we've sort of taken, um, you know, the, the recorders of transactions and accounting and stuff, and we turned it around and called ourselves builders um, because we were building capacity. We were building efficiencies. We were building um, these uh, areas to support um, some of the new uh, research and paradigm shifts that were coming out due to COVID. And um, once, you know, this, we had this shift, um, it shifted staff, just culture uh, around our finance team on, um, on, on sort of, uh, you know, building capacity and innovation around finance and how we can support with live data, because that's what we, we got in flux with all of this uh, funding for financial assistance and rental assistance. And we had to, you know, 
have live data available daily on on balances and what utilization was happening. There was this whole thing, and so um, it was it was really terrific uh, shift. Um, and as I was looking at this, I, I just see some of that uh, coming directly from this type of methodology um, that directly impacted us. Um, you know, that's just sort of sort of an example of what came in from uh, our end. I, and I think it's a perfect example of what we're talking about here, right? Which is the alignment of the CF role and, and finance mm. to uh, mission. Yeah. So um, contribution made by the CFO. We talked about the, the mission uh, and Jolene just shared a little bit on there. Uh, but what are some of the other items that I know um, you have done with Samaritan House and the CFO and the finance team? Yeah, well, I, if there's other CFOs out there, I know a, sort of this bad cop, uh, you know, we're always the uh, doom and gloom. And I think um, moving from from that or saying no to a lot of things in sort of in the old the old ways, is you know, looking for the opportunities to say yes, because that's what we really want to do is we want to say yes and figure out a way to accomplish some of these things. And I think finance has, of course, again, unique role to, to add that and be a, a motivator, be a cheerleader, to uh, you know be seen as the resource to get it done. Um, and I think by being that uh, you know, supporter of, of what's going on, um, you know, there's there's lots of things that can move the needle to make things happen. So, uh, you know, right. we don't want to be the bad cops anymore. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, we, and we don't have to be. So I think right. it's a good strategy. We're no longer the bean counters. We're the strategists. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, our last polling question, uh, thinking about your organization's uh, mission, um, programs, systems which is the most needed by your organization and you know this would be a, a good checkpoint <laughs> very good well we are close to the end of our time and uh, I wanted to make sure we uh, talked about any closing thoughts that uh, John and Jolie, you might want to uh, share with us. I'm happy to, to kick us off. Uh, and it really builds on what Jolie was saying about her organization's actual experience with the pandemic. A crisis, uh, including a public health crisis such as the pandemic, or an economic crisis uh, um, is always going to reveal gaps, uh, gaps in our organizations, gaps in our teams, our finance departments, other departments, and gaps in the individuals we work with, as well as gaps in ourselves. And I think what I, what I was hearing and what Jolie was saying is they they identified the gaps and they've been addressing them. And the gift of a crisis is to come out of it a stronger, better you, a stronger, better team, a stronger, better organization. If your organization is not on that path, get help because that's the gift of the crisis. As long as we're going to suffer <laughs> and go through all this, there might there should be something in it for the organization and for yourself uh, at the end of it. And, so, and again, I think the silver lining, you said it right uh, perfectly, John, is the silver lining of coming of a crisis is, you know, how can you take advantage and build something better and lasting for your organization during difficult times um, and, you know, zero in on that. And it, it just changes the approach um, and it's very energizing. There we sure. go. Well, I would like to thank uh, John and Jolie. Uh, wonderful session, lots of really wonderful, great information in there. Uh, we will be updating the um, collaboration with the 
uh, polling responses as well. So more information for you to take back and think about with your organizations. Uh, thank you and feel free, please, to reach out to any of us. Our email uh, contact information is there and we will be very happy. John, I know John, Jolie and myself will be very happy to answer any uh, questions at any time. Thanks so much, Jackie. Thank you.